Well, uh, good afternoon, all of you uh, who are here. I appreciate you being here on time. Um, I anticipate there will be some more folks joining us, but I wanted to pick up where I left off uh, last week. We were talking about the assessment of the three column spine. And so this uh, was put forward in the early 80s um, by Dennis and basically talked about components of the anterior column as you look at the spine. Let's see if I can move forward a little bit on these. So that would include the anterior longitudinal ligament the anterior uh, vertebrae and the anterior discs. Um, the middle column, on the other hand, includes the posterior vertebral bodies, the posterior discs, and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, and then finally, the posterior column includes the vertebral arch, it includes the ligamentum flavum, the supraspinous ligament, and the inter or intraspinous uh, ligaments as well. And so the the point of the three column spine was that if you had two or more columns uh, disrupted, then it was considered to be unstable. And for uh, quite a while, that was essentially how the orthopedists and the neurosurgeons made determinations of whether or not uh, you needed to go in and do uh, additional stabilization. Um, of note, if the middle column was disrupted, then you almost always had involvement of either the anterior and the posterior or both um, as you went through there. So again, um, going way back into the early 80s, surgical stabilization of the spine was indicated if you have uh, two or more of these columns involved. And so I wanted to go through briefly mechanisms of spinal injuries. Now recognize, as I say spinal, I mean the, ver the vertebrae and the discs and the spinal column. Uh, the cord is a separate component of that. And so I wanna have you all kind of keep that in mind. There seems to have been over the years here, um, kind of a blend of spine and spinal cord. And while that may be the case, it isn't always. And so you can have spinous disruption without cord disruption. At times you can have cord disruption without spine disruption. And so we'll go into that in more detail. What I'm gonna talk about here is about trauma. And so direct trauma or transmitted forces from either a violent head or trunk uh, motion could contribute to instability. The type and the extent of the bony injury does depend upon the body's position, as well as the magnitude, intensity, and duration of the applied force. Um, depending upon how that occurred, then you would have certain patterns of ligamentous and bony injury. Uh, as well as neurological dysfunction if the cord was involved. Um, and all of that uh, takes into account the anatomy of the cord, its vascular supply, and or the spinal nerves uh, that are at each level of the cord as we go through there. So if we start off with cervical injuries, we recognize that that's a pretty big problem. Um, because of the mechanical stability, uh, or instability of the neck and its uh, vulnerability to trauma. So dependent upon the individual, child, adolescent, or adult, you're sitting somewhere between 10 and 14 pounds of weight just from the head itself on a relatively unstable spine. Um, so most um, cervical injuries actually don't have neurological deficit. However, it depends again on the, the magnitude and the amount of disruption uh, that went along with this. Most are lower cervical um, and rarely do we see C1 and C2 injuries, partly because of the large canal size and partly if there is significant disruption of the cord at that level, most folks uh, have death um, almost immediately because it cuts off the respiratory centers uh, in particular. So the mechanisms of cervical injuries play out at a thoracic and lumbar uh, region as well. And so once you learn these for the cervical injury, you'll also pretty much know them for thoracic or lumbar uh, disruptions. And so we're gonna talk through each of these, um, compressive flexion, distractive flexion, vertical compression, compressive extension, distractive extension, and lateral flexion. And I will be running through these relatively quickly, however, um, as we go through, you should be able to uh, pretty much characterize these uh, mechanisms and subsequently the amount of spine instability and or cord injury involved. So compressive flexion, um, 
is one in which you have the highest incidence of neurological deficits. And that's because uh, essentially you've got a rapid deceleration. This is where you have, and generally speaking, uh, <clears throat> two young men coming at each other uh, in a game that we used to call chicken way back in the day in automobiles. And these automobiles weighing several tons, uh, uh, tons when they collide, there is a, sig a significant amount of force uh, generated to the head and neck um, such that you have an anterior compression and a posterior distraction force uh, in between these, almost complete disruption of the entire three column spine and subsequently significant neurological disruption because of the cord that's caught in between there. So the next type is distractive flexion and it's very similar uh, to what we had just seen, except this is where one of the folks turned away just before they hit. And that rotation actually put them into a situation where they're gonna end up with locked facets. You still have total disruption of the three column spine, but now you're in a locked facet kind of a scenario, and it's going to require significant distraction uh, in order to unlock those facets. Again, associated with severe neurological deficits. Vertical compression um, is when you have axial loading through a straight or slightly flexed neck. Um, so examples of this, those folks who are, are diving into shallow uh, pools or shallow uh, ponds, um, or those folks who stand up quickly on an airplane and hit their head overhead, um, causing an axial load. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna see bony fragments driven posteriorly into the canal, and it's those fragments compressing the cord that causes the neurological deficit associated with them. Oftentimes, this will be associated with what you talked about earlier, the central cord syndrome, where you have upper extremities uh, involved to a much greater extent than the lower extremities. Um, compressive extension is uh, for that little old lady who had no idea that there was this race going on around her. And so somebody is racing through and, and they hit her from behind and it throws her head back. So now you've got a, a situation where you've got compression at the posterior elements, but you have anterior longitudinal ligament rupture. Um, and again, this is uh, the, the type of a scenario where you can have significant disruption. If she looked up in the rear view mirror because she heard brakes screeching behind her, and had a rotatory uh, component to it, then she would have um, also this distractive extension with rotation and again, a locked facet type of scenario. So anytime you have a rotatory component, you're gonna end up with locked facets. And again, all the time that these facets are locked like that, you've got uh, ischemia or infarct um, as those uh, components are impinging upon the cord itself. So again, uh, severe neurological deficits. Lateral flexion is a rare, uh, relatively rare injury. Um, it occurs uh, most commonly with uh, like a motorcycle rider who hits uh, his, his head uh, and there's a force against uh, the neck that's going in a different direction for the body. Um, and subsequently you end up with this type of an injury. When you do see it, it's almost always associated with a brachial plexus injury um, as we're going through there. So, so I'll go through briefly the thoracic injuries, um, but recognize that essentially the same mechanisms come into play here. The major difference in, in the thoracic spine is that um, you've got the ribs as well, uh, providing uh, additional structural components um, and, and support. And so unless you damage the rib cage, um, it's unlikely that you're going to have a significant thoracic injury because of trauma. If you do, however, um, you have had a huge force to this area that would cause both rib fractures as well as thoracic spine fractures. And the other um, contributing factor in the thoracic region, particularly the upper and mid thoracic region, is the vascular supply is not quite as good. And so you have a relatively small canal size and then you have a watershed zone so that if you do have a mid thoracic type of injury, it's almost always complete um, as a result of a trauma, I should say. Um, so 
That said, let's talk through some of these different types of injuries. A compressive flexion um, is going to be the most common type of injury that you would see. Generally, you're going to see this with older individuals who are somewhat osteopenic. Um, you already have, most of us have a natural kyphosis, and it simply converts that uh, with vertical compression uh, into compression at this area, potentially um, pushing the uh, vertebral body and, and elements into the spinal canal. Uh, the next is a distractive flexion type of injury. So uh, this is where you have anterior compression, posterior distraction with rotation. And again, uh, almost always you three, see a three column involvement with bony fragments into the canal impinging upon the cord and significant neurological uh, injury because of that. The vertical compression, so this is where an individual is struck by a falling object, uh, so a boulder, a tree, something along those lines, um, or they fall uh, with significant compression axial loading, again, crushing the vertebral body, pushing the fractured arch and uh, bone into the canal and causing significant uh, impingement on the cord. The lumbar injuries, uh, again, most commonly occur at T12 through L1. Why is that? Well, the rib cage ends right there. And so that makes the lumbar spine particularly vulnerable uh, to forces being transmitted in, in this region. Um, now, generally speaking, lumbar injuries um, are incomplete, uh, partly because they have a good vascular supply, there's a relatively large canal, um, and or remember that the cord typically ends around L1 or L2. So the re remaining neural elements from that point are cauda equina. And so unless you have complete uh, uh, disruption of the cauda equina, generally you're gonna see uh, some ability to recover uh, from these lumbar regions. Um, so again, a distractive uh, flexion. This is uh, typically um, when the lumbar spine is flexed violently over a fulcrum. What would that be? That would be the seat belt. Back in the day before we had the shoulder straps that went along, especially in the back seat, um, the fulcrum itself then became the belt and the belt was the contributor to many lumbar uh, spinal cord injuries as we went through that, typically associated with abdominal uh, injuries as well. Now, how, how do we determine need for surgical stabilization? Keep in mind the three column spine because that still applies although we've gotten a little bit more uh, technically advanced over the years. Recognize that um, uh, less than 50%, less than the majority of uh, spine injuries actually require surgical stabilization. Um, for those that do, most will require one spine surgery um, and uh, occasionally they need to have both anterior and posterior fixation. The ideal would be to have surgical stabilization within 24 hours, partly to decompress the, uh, any impingement upon the cord um, and subsequently trying to improve neurological outcome. The initial studies, however, that have tried to look at um, you know, decompression within the first 24 hours um, had very, very small ends because they couldn't get consent approved uh, that quickly in uh, most of these acute spinal cord injury traumas. So what are the goals of surgical stabilization? Well, certainly to restore spine alignment and establish stability. Um, hopefully, we would also prevent further neurological deterioration and hopefully uh, provide neurological recovery. Um, so I mentioned that we've become a little bit more uh, as our technology has developed a little bit more sensitive to some of these things. But you'll notice, and I'll talk you through these, um, but the, uh, the Telix uh, system uh, put forward by Vaccaro in 2005 essentially still comes back to the three column spine um, in that you assign points for uh, certain components here. So if you had a burst fracture, you've got at least uh, one point. If there is translation or rotation involved, you get three points and distraction, you get four points. So essentially to, to have distraction, you've got two or more columns uh, disrupted. The um, incomplete injuries uh, would land you with three points. 
a caught equina injury would lead you with three points. Um, notice that if you had a significant posterior ligamentous disruption, then you also got three points. And so the bottom line is as you add these points up and you get more than four, that's going to indicate um, fusion basically of the spine for uh, stabilization purposes. Um, and so again, if you have significant distraction of two or more columns, if you have posterior longitudinal ligament involved, you're almost always going to have uh, stabilization required. And then it becomes a question of, do you do um, an anterior approach? Do you do a posterior approach or, you, or do you do a combination? And more and more when we see these significant disruption of uh, two or three columns of the spine, they're, they're doing a combination of anterior and posterior approach, which is gonna have some, um, some uh, implications in terms of what, what kind of um, support are we gonna have to provide with regard to orthotics uh, as we go through there. And, I, and I'll talk through those in a few moments. So again, surgical stabilization, basically, uh, we're looking at these kinds of numbers. Recognize that a bullet uh, removal in the lumbar spine will improve lower extremity motor score, but uh, if you have a bullet in the cervical or thoracic spine column, uh, generally they have found that you end up mucking up the neurological status to a greater extent because you don't have as much room to work with there. Um, and so generally you'll see bullets remain. Um, that, that's not bad surgical care or bad trauma care. It's simply that those bullets trying to, dis, uh, to dislodge them or move them, remove them, um, basically would lead to greater neurological deficits than if we just left them there. So generally they don't go after uh, a bullet unless it's in the lumbar spine. So the post-operative management is something that we need to be uh, aware of. Generally, we're gonna put folks on log roll precautions, either for the cervical and or thoracic and or lumbar spine. Um, however, uh, if we're going to provide a, a spinal orthosis, and we typically do when they're out of bed, um, we have to also make sure that the orthotic is fitting appropriately. And I'll touch upon this a little bit more as we go through. Um, restrictions may also include uh, keeping the head of the bed elevated less than 30 degrees, no hip flexion more than 90 degrees, and always using the orthosis uh, when the person is out of bed. Now typical or orthosis that you may be seeing includes the halo vest. The halo vest basically um, we actually screw, uh, we put screws into the halo in the anterior and posterior skull. Um, and uh, we go ahead and screw those down um, so that it maintains the, the halo. And then we have four posts provided, two anteriorly and two posteriorly um, on a thoracic vest uh, that fits there. When fitted appropriately, this will restrict 90% of flexion and extension. It will restrict all lateral flexion and rotation, um, but recognize that uh, this is only as effective as the fit of the vest itself. And so another thing that happens with many of our cervical spinal cord injuries is that because of lack of neurological um, innervation now to the pecs uh, and sometimes to the shoulder muscles, they have an awful lot of muscular atrophy within the first few weeks after, um, after their spinal cord injury. And so they may end up losing quite a bit of muscle mass in the chest. Um, and as that happens, uh, you have more and more play here. So we have to monitor closely and make sure there's never more than two finger breadths of, um, of space between the vest and the person's chest. Uh, if there is, then we have to reset uh, how well this is fitting. Um, the sternal occipital mandibular immobilizer, rarely used anymore. Um, this was called a SOMI. It was also uh, considered a torture device, basically because it caused pressure injuries in the occiput and in the chin. Um, and so while it was somewhat effective, it was nowhere near as effective as the halo vest. And so if you need this kind of stability, typically they're gonna be going to the halo vest instead um, because you almost always ended up with uh, pressure injuries at the chin and the occiput, which then uh, 
led to more complications as we were trying to uh, move forward with their rehabilitation. So uh, most of the time now for cervical spine uh, fixation, we end up putting people into a hard cervical collar. There are several different types, including the Miami uh, and the J uh, collar, the Newport collar. Um, the bottom line is a well-fitting cervical orthosis will restrict 75% of flexion and extension, um, as well as lateral flexion. Um, it will limit 50% rotation. However, if it's not fit appropriately and the person brings their chin down inside, they can turn their head almost completely uh, within the full range of motion. And so we have to go by as we are seeing our folks in the morning, make sure that this is fit appropriately and that they don't have too much uh, wiggle room literally uh, within that. Finally, a soft co uh, cervical collar is essentially a medical legal device and provides almost no medical stability. Um, so it restricts, you know, less than 5% flexion extension. It limits uh, lateral flexion, almost not at all. And it has no rotational restriction. So it really is essentially a um, medical legal device used in the courtrooms and outside of the courtrooms. Typically, you're not gonna see it uh, on, on a patient. Um, the thoracolumbosacral orthosis, or the TLSO, also known as a clamshell brace, has a posterior and an anterior component to it. Um, often this will be uh, fit over a person's uh, t-shirt, um, although sometimes if it's set just for the skin, it'll have a sheepskin lining. Uh, to, um, part, part of that is it helps uh, with folks who've been sweating a lot, but it also helps to cushion and make it less likely that they will be developing pressure injuries, particularly at the inferior angles of the uh, scapula and or at the ribs. So a well-fitted TLSO uh, that incorporates the hip that is in parentheses uh, will restrict flexion and extension 90 degrees. If it doesn't incorporate the hips, it will only restrict to about 60%. Um, a, uh, a TLSO incorporating the hip will limit uh, lateral flexion by 70%. If you don't incorporate the hip, only about 50%. And then it will limit rotation if you incorporate the hip uh, to 90%. But if you don't incorporate the hip, it only limits about 30% of rotation. So the, the interesting thing is, is as you look at the literature and you try to decide how long does a person need to be in these orthotics, we don't know. I mean, is the bottom line. The literature um, is not clear and the neurosurgeons and the orthopedists will also tell you it's not real clear. So we'll do multiple imaging studies to see how the spine is fusing. Um, so we always start off with about 12 weeks, um, but then it's variable depending upon if the person had anterior and posterior um, or only uh, one of those options as fusion as we go through there. A lumbosacral orthosis, uh, again, fairly um, limiting, uh, restricting about 60% of flexion and extension, 40% um, of lateral flexion, but only about 20% of rotation. And so this is more of a, um, a reminder of the patient not to get overly aggressive uh, while they're wearing this. Now, what I wanna do is to spend the remaining amount of our time briefly talking through some of these comorbidities. And I say briefly, because each of them is associated with a one hour lecture that I will be doing over the course of the uh, next five months. So recognize that a person who um, has a new spinal cord injury, and, and let's start at the worst scenario, a cervical spinal cord injury, is going to have almost all of these comorbidities. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking even at a young, yeah. healthy male athlete um, who sustains a new spinal cord injury is going to have almost all of these comorbidities and then later on some of the chronic things that are associated with those. Um, and so I'm gonna close out this lecture, ans answer any questions that folks may have uh, with regards to spine stabilization. Okay, we'll just go ahead and do the overtime or the volunteer, whatever you need to do. I'm sorry? Okay, so um, that said, I'm gonna be moving forward with the uh, comorbidities lecture or trying to. Uh,
as we move forward. Um, here again, uh, it'll come back to the pathophysiology of the spinal cord and, and subsequently an injury. I've, I've discussed that uh, in the previous lecture, and so really I'm gonna probably just jump right into the comorbidities and talk about the influence of the somatic and autonomic nervous system dysfunction um, and why that has contributed so greatly to these comorbidities. So again, you just saw this coming up. I'm gonna run through these uh, with our remaining time today um, and, and starting off with pulmonary dysfunction. Um, so back in the day, uh, people who sustained a spinal cord injury died most of the time um, either because of pulmonary dysfunction early on or renal dysfunction a little bit later on uh, uh, related to the spinal cord injury. Pulmonary dysfunction is significant in spinal cord injury, particularly high spinal cord injury, because you end up with both a restrictive, a neurogenic restrictive lung disease, as well as a neurogenic obstructive lung disease. Um, so the neurogenic restrictive uh, component comes in because you no longer have the abdominal musculature to help clear secretions. You no longer have potentially the, um, the intercostal muscles to help expand the uh, chest for inspiration. And then the obstructive component because of the parasympathetic dominance now that you have disruption of the sympathetic nervous system from the thoracolumbar lumbar regions of the cord. So the restrictive lung disease uh, is characterized by low vital capacities, low total lung capacity, shallow breathing, uh, so that your tidal volume uh, yours or mine is, you know, somewhere 500, 800 cc's. A person with new spinal cord injury, um, for a couple of reasons, is going to have a, a very limited ability to inspire. Um, so they'll have rapid breathing, tachypnea. The work of breathing is going to be significantly greater um, and part, partly attributed to the elastic work of breathing. Other examples that you might know of and things that may play into our spine disruption include scoliosis uh, and obesity as we go through this. So again, the obstructive component because of parasympathetic dominance, um, you're now going to end up with uh, tight pipes with a lot of gunk in them um, so that uh, it gets very, very difficult. And this is uh, what I'm advocating. Uh, all of our residents should be providing Anybody with a high thoracic or cervical spinal cord injury should um, put our patients on this type of a protocol, including nebulizer treatments, ideally duo nebs with ipotropium bromide as well as uh, atrovent, I'm sorry, albuterol, um, followed uh, immediately by postural percussion and drainage and or vibration, followed immediately by mechanical and extrapolation. Yes. Um, we can't see your new slides. We're stuck well, on the bibliography from your old slides. Well, thank you for telling me. I didn't know that. Let's try a new share. Can you see it now? Okay, let's yes. stop sharing. Oh. <laughs> now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up again. Thank, thank you for speaking up. There you go. Yeah. So now, now we're moving, uh, let me go back just one slide because this is an important slide or try, try to go back one slide. Now I've lost, I've lost my ability to control the slides. Um, so again, this is, uh, this is the bottom line with regard to respiratory management. Providing nebulizer treatments, postural percussion and drainage and or vibration um, and mechanical and exsufflation all within 30 minutes so that you clear those moistened secretions. Um, if you don't clear them within 30 minutes, they just dry up and you end up with mucus plugging. And the person ends up in, in respiratory distress and requires uh, typically pulmonary intervention with bronchoscopy. Uh, so we try to avoid that whenever possible. So the other uh, influence, significant influence of autonomic nervous system uh, is on the cardiovascular system. And so again, uh, recognizing that it's the, particularly the high thoracic regions of the cord that provide sympathetic influence on, on the heart and on the vascular system, when you have blunted this now, 
um, you no longer have chronotropic um, or inotropic control of the heart and or the vascular system. And so you end up with a scenario we call circulatory hypokinesis uh, because of the blunted sympathetic response, you have parasympathetic dominance, um, and that results in what? Uh, so reduced vasoconstriction, so your afterload is going to be diminished, your total peripheral resistance diminished, and the person is going to have a neurogenic hypotension. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, on the other side of the vascular tree, the venous side, you also have venodilation without sympathetic influences. And so you have the venous system, particularly in the lower extremities, but your inferior vena cava, instead of holding only about 500 cc's of blood as it is for you and I at the moment, um, now with this new venodilation and the inability to vasoconstrict, you end up with about two liters of blood in the inferior vena cava. Uh, and so now you've got about three liters of blood kind of sitting, languishing in the inferior vena cava and your lower extremities and very little um, circulating through the upper extremity. Um, so because of the diminished afterload and the diminished preload, you're gonna end up with re diminished resistance, diminished Frank Starling mechanisms for contractility, and you'll end up with an adaptive myocardial atrophy. So the heart actually becomes weaker as a muscle uh, because it hasn't had to work up against that. Um, and uh, you no longer have the sympathetic influence to the SA node. So now you've got a blunted chronotropic response with an inability to raise the heart rate more than 120 beats per minute, uh, even under significant uh, circumstances. These folks are also at risk for heart block and other dysrhythmias uh, as we're going through there. So again, we'll end up having to manage in the first couple of weeks on rehabilitation, our, um, our goal is to try to keep the person from, from passing out uh, every time they sit up. Um, and so we'll use compression garments, not TED hose, and I'll talk about TED hose in a la uh, later lecture, um, but compression garments to the lower extremities and abdominal binder to compress uh, abdominal contents against the inferior vena cava uh, and try to push more blood back up into the heart where you have uh, a better left ventricular and diastolic volume. Um, we may also have to add in uh, Midadrin or Florinef, uh, again, whole different uh, discussions on those. Uh, and at least in the short term, we may have to uh, use a temporary cardiac pacing uh, for the individual because they will braid it down in under this uh, new parasympathetic dominance. Um, they are at high risk for venothromboembolus. And this is partly because of the venous stasis uh, that we talked about but it's also uh, because of the, the actual clotting cascade changes in response to a spinal cord injury and the change of influence on the vessels, particularly with regard to antithrombin-3 and whatnot. So again, we'll go through a whole nother lecture on this, uh, but these folks are at high risk because of the entire Virchow's triad, triad um, separate lecture. That'll be coming up uh, within the next couple of weeks. Autonomic dysfunction is profound, uh, again, because of the parasympathetic dominance. But the other thing is that um, these folks, while they may lose sensation completely below the level of the injury, particularly those with uh, complete spinal cord injury, noxious stimuli, is it, it, you have those influences still ascending um, tracks in the cord, um, but they, they get blocked, so you never actually sense those up in the brain. Uh, they get blocked at the level of spinal cord injury and cause a sympathetic outflow um, and subsequently splanchnic vasoconstriction that causes the blood pressure to go up very, very high. Um, that hypertensive crisis can result then in strokes, seizures, organ failure, and death, all of which are suboptimal. So typically, the, uh, the most likely culprit is going to be related to the GU system, most likely a distended bladder early in the person's course. Um, so that again, when, when, when you or I have a distended bladder, we, we experience significant discomfort and then ultimately pain. Uh, 
And that tells us we got to go, got to go, got to go. Um, a person with spinal cord injury doesn't have those signals. Um, well, they do have signals ascending the cord, but they're blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury. And you do get this reflex sympathetic outflow causing splanchnic vasoconstriction and subsequently the hypertensive crisis. The increased pressure is sensed by baroreceptors that send information to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart trying to dissipate all of this and resulting in bradycardia. But below the level of the injury, you remain vasoconstricted. Above the level of injury, you have vasodilating uh, uh, and sweating and uh, flushing as you try to dissipate this overall pressure. And so um, this is one of those things, uh, this is one of the few PM&R emergencies that you need to know about. And we're gonna have a whole lecture just on this to talk about management strategies. Um, starting with this, but then including uh, some of the things that Dr. Uh, Dalal had recently incorporated into your uh, Cerner quick order sets uh, to manage autonomic dysreflexia. Um, whole separate lecture on neurogenic bladder. Uh, we, you and I forget that uh, part of uh, what happens after a spinal cord injury, in addition to autonomic dysreflexia, is spasticity, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but when you have spasticity of both bladder and sphincters, you end up pushing urine upwards instead of uh, outwards, and uh, this puts the kidneys at risk. It also increases significantly the pressure within the bladder and can again cause autonomic dysreflexia. So that's for an upper motor neuron, true spinal cord injury. We recognize that some folks will have a lower motor neuron injury associated with Cauda Aquinas syndrome, for example, or uh, Conus medullaris syndrome, and we're going to have to manage all of these different things, including uh, renal dysfunction, urinary tract infections, and calculi. Luckily, not trigger geometry, but we'll get back to that at a different time. Neurogenic bowel, similarly, um, our folks with spinal cord injury will no longer have voluntary control over their sphincters, um, and they won't have significant uh, control that they learned as a child how to manage their bowels um, and maintain fecal continence. Um, and so the, the downside of this is they end up uh, a lot of times with constipation um, and or they end up with a similar situation with contraction of sphincters um, and puborectalis in particular that prevents defecation, that increased pressure would cause pain if they could sense pain, but they don't. And so it just ends up resulting in autonomic dysreflexia. So the number one cause of autonomic dysreflexia is number one, that is bladder. Uh, the number two cause of autonomic dysreflexia is number two. Um, and so whole separate lecture on this as we go through. Um, let's see. Next, uh, we're gonna talk about pressure injuries. These are not uh, associated with the spinal cord injury itself, but because the person lacks sensation, um, even as you've been sitting there listening to me uh, today, you've moved multiple times, maybe subconsciously not realizing that you've had some tissue ischemia and you're getting signals that this is uncomfortable and you need to move to allow for pressure relief um, on, on the vascular supply to your batocal region. Um, so recognize that the major thing that we need to do uh, is to prevent pressure injuries. And we spend an awful lot of time teaching folks about prophylaxis. Uh, when they occur, um, we, we know that it's going to take about $100,000 to heal a pressure injury, uh, more than a grade two or stage two pressure injury. So whole separate lecture just on pressure injuries, a sore spot with many of us. Spasticity. Uh, so this is hyperreflexia. Um, what I just showed you there was clonus, that is hyperreflexia on both sides of the joint. Um, and we're going to see associated upper uh, motor neuron or long track signs, such as the Babinski sign um, in the lower extremities or the Hoffman's reflex in the upper extremities. Um, Spasticity is defined as velocity dependent tone as opposed to rigidity, which doesn't uh, depend upon the velocity of movement. Um, 
So this has to do with disinhibition of reflex arcs. Um, this is very closely associated with autonomic dysreflexia, especially uh, those individuals with injuries of T6 and above. Um, and we're going to talk through the different classifications of spasticity and management strategies, including modalities, pharmacological management, uh, neurolysis, and in some cases, surgical interventions that are required to manage problematic spasticity. Now, that said, recognize that not all spasticity is in fact problematic. And I like to have a little bit of tone remaining for our folks with spinal cord injury to maintain some degree of muscle mass, some energy expenditure, and some degree of, of bone mineralization. So if you take away spasticity completely, um, you actually may contribute to uh, those um, comorbidities, uh, particularly associated with uh, obesity or neurogenic obesity. Sexuality is also affected for both men and women. Um, men uh, typically will also have an associated infertility issue. Recognize that um, while both men and women may have reflex uh, ability to, to gain an erection and or clitoral engorgement, um, they uh, are also at significant risk during that of having autonomic dysreflexia. What? Yes, uh, sex, uh, the act of sexual intercourse can cause, unfortunately, autonomic dysreflexia for both men and women. And we're gonna be talking through that a little bit more. For women, there's, uh, there's another issue in that um, usually uh, women, premenstrual women will uh, regain the ability to become pregnant within two to three months of their uh, traumatic spinal cord injury. Um, recognize that uh, the, um, the pregnancy, uh, Braxton Hicks contractions, um, and particularly labor and delivery, those are considered noxious stimuli below the level of their spinal cord injury and can also lead to autonomic dysreflexia, stroke out and die. And so we have to um, be very, very uh, attentive to women who may be wanting to have children, be working very closely with their obstetricians as well as the anesthesiologist um, as they progress through their pregnancy and especially at labor and delivery. Um, there are other spinal cord injury health risks, um, particularly neurogenic obesity uh, in which a person will develop metabolic syndrome because of a tremendous about amount of adipose tissue that accumulates um, because of um, energy uh, in balance between intake and energy expenditure. And I'm gonna talk through some of these other things as well. So we are updating uh, this year actually, um, the issues of obesity after spinal cord injury. But a brief preview is that these folks after spinal cord injury will end up with an obligatory sarcopenia. They lose muscle mass, they lose it fast. They also have a blunted anabolism, they, they lose the the uh, anabolic hormones associated with muscle growth. Uh, and then they have this blunted sympathetic nervous system as well, all of which contribute to a positive energy balance, which is a negative thing. Um, the other thing that we will be talking about in upcoming lectures is that it's actually obesity that uh, mediates metabolic syndrome. That is, it causes insulin resistance, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and puts people at higher risk for thromboemboli. Uh, and so huge issues really we're just starting to understand uh, and work on management strategies for this. Um, ventilatory responses to exercise. Usually ventilation is not a limiting factor in exercise, but it is for folks with spinal cord injury. Uh, those with injuries, particularly above T10, who are gonna have limited ability for um, respiratory inspiration um, as well as expiration. Um, and so we're gonna have to talk through that a little bit. We will talk about the blunted thermal regulation after spinal cord injury, again, because of the autonomic dysfunction. Um, and the fact that um, our, our folks with high spinal cord injury can't sweat below the level of their injury. And so trying to dissipate heat um, is, um, is almost a lost cause. So uh, there are times when we have to rely on cooling vests, for example, 
Um, and especially in the warm humid climates that we experience in South Florida, we have to be attentive to that. That said, recognize that folks can become hypothermic uh, on a hot day if they're um, under the shade of a tree uh, and or there's a light breeze going by, they can actually, their, their body temperature takes on the temperature of their uh, of the environment around them, that, that is their ambient uh, environment. And so um, some really strange things going on with regard to thermal regulation after spinal cord injury. I mentioned a little bit about the disruption of anabolic hormones. There are also catabolic hormones um, uh, associated with spinal cord injury at different levels. And so we're gonna spend some time talking through those uh, as well. Um, there is a significant influence on bone uh, mineralization um, or demineralization after spinal cord injury, largely due to mechanical unloading, but also because of uh, changes in the hormonal milieu, neuronal changes that occur after spinal cord injury, and the increased uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines associated with obesity that stimulate osteoplastic activity. So there's actually four different mechanisms by which spinal cord injury contributes to osteopenia and osteoporosis. So we'll be talking about that, and in the acute setting, we'll also have to have discussions about immobilization, hypercalcemia, particularly with young men who get a traumatic spinal cord injury and they start dumping calcium out of their bones that are no longer being, uh, being used. They end up with this hypercalcemia and subsequently a syndrome, stones, bones, groans, and psychic moans. So learning how to manage that and then also learning that uh, as spasticity develops in these folks, that puts abnormal forces uh, in those, those limbs uh, that, that are being affected, particularly uh, increasing the amount of um, mesenchymal uh, bone growth in the, in the joints. And so particularly in the hips and knees for both paraplegia as well as tetraplegia, they end up with this abnormal periarticular bone we refer to as heterotopic ossification. And we have to learn how to manage that because that can also be very limiting with regards to uh, function of those joints as we go through there. Our upper extremities actually were not made to move our bodies around. And so um, even for those folks with paraplegia, relatively fortunate who are able to use uh, manual wheelchairs for uh, their mobility, they are going to end up with significant overuse in their shoulders, elbows, wrists, and hands. They are at high risk for uh, mononeuropathies, particularly ulnar neuropathies and uh, carpal tun tunnel syndrome, median neuropathy, but they're also at high, high risk for rotator cuff impingement, uh, dequervins, tenosynovitis, and MCP dysfunction. So we're going to spend some time talking through that we're also gonna talk through neuropathic pain, um, which is uh, a predominant feature, unfortunately, with our folks with spinal cord injury. So in addition to the nociceptive pain in those areas above their level of injury, they are at high risk for neuropathic pain at the level of injury, above the level of injury, as we're talking through some of those mononeuropathies, and then below the level of the injury, it can be especially uh, uh, important for us to determine a cause of autonomic dysreflexia, uh, that the person doesn't realize what's going on. Somehow they keep getting autonomic dysreflexia and it may be because of neuropathic pain below the level of their injury. Um, we spend a lot of time and energy uh, doing annual evaluations and during those evaluations uh, spend uh, a, a fair amount of time making sure that the person hasn't changed neurological function below the level of the injury especially, but also above the level of the injury. If they are having changes, sensory or motor changes, that could herald a, a, the development of a, a syrinx, syringomyelia, um, and that can compromise uh, future sensory and motor function as well. And then finally, we're gonna spend some time talking about motor recovery. Everybody wants to know you know, what am I gonna get back after my spinal cord injury? And we'll talk a little bit about the prognostic uh, indicators of motor recovery. Um, and then we will talk through some of the, the potential interventions that have been tried, that are being tried, that will be tried in the future to uh, try to optimize recovery after spinal cord injury. 
So I try to get this down to, um, you know, the 15 minutes that I'm supposed to be left speaking. Um, I've got a few minutes left for uh, questions, uh, recognizing that many of your questions will be answered in upcoming weeks as we talk through each of those different comorbidities. Um, I think the next section that we have actually, though, is going to be on how do we classify spinal cord injury using the international standards for the neurological classification of spinal cord injury. That said, I'll open up for questions, thoughts, concerns. Wow, absolutely quiet. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't make the uh, transition well enough in that first, uh, first couple of slides on the pulmonary dysfunction, but I promise uh, on the respiratory lecture, you'll, you'll get plenty. Um, so it's not, I don't want you to just blow it off, so to speak. All right, I'll wait another minute or two for those of you who are on uh, for questions. Otherwise, I look forward to uh, meeting with you next week. Dr. Gator, this is Ray. How can we gain access to the recordings? Um, well, the folks at the Miami Project have been uh, uh, saving these, and so they will give us instructions um, that I can pass on to you over the next week. Okay, I appreciate it. All righty. All right, thanks all. Have a wonderful day.